if you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your life fills up with low priority distractions that don't. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 221. Jesse Chapp is here with Marty Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Dr. John Martini. He's considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal development. He's the founder of the Martini Institute, a private research and educational organization with a curriculum of over 72 courses covering multiple aspects of human development. Dr. Martini travels 360 days a year to countries all over the globe where he shares his research and findings. Dr. Martini has been doing this work for so long, and he is a very well-respected authority in the world of personal growth, and we are so happy to have had him on our show. So here's some of what we get into today. We talk about how to set goals on what you really value, the power of delegation, eliminating distractions while keeping focused, and factors that make for a healthy romantic relationship. Lots of great, powerful information that we get into. Here we go with Dr. Martini. Hi, Dr. Martini. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. There's so much we want to get into, but I think it's important we go back and start off by telling a little bit about your story. And I actually want to go way back to, I think it was when you were about 13 years old. And Dr. Martini, you actually left home at this age. So let's talk about what happened here. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate, but we'll see. <laughs> I was playing pool with my dad in our barn. It was about 4.30 in the afternoon, and I said, Dad, I need to go cleaned up. I'm going into town today. He said, well, son, you've been into town every day this week. You need to stay home tonight. And I didn't want to tell him that I had a girl that I was meeting up with for some reason. He said, well, you need to stay home. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to mess up this date. He said, well, if you go out tonight, you don't come back. <laughs> you don't, you're going to be defiant like that. And I said, well, I guess I'll have to do that. So that's what started me to move on. And I had already had learning problems as a child anyway. So I had been school challenged and I decided I was going to be independent. So I started at age 13. I was out on my own. Okay. So what do the next couple of years look like? Well, I uh, hung out in bowling alleys that were open 24 hours a day. I hung out in parks. I hung out at friends. I worked odd little jobs. I lived in a diner. When I turned 14, I hitchhiked out to California. I lived at the beach for a while, then I lived in California, lived out at the beach there. And then eventually at 15, I panhandled enough money to fly to Hawaii. And I first slept underneath a bridge there. Then I went into a park bench, then a park, then an abandoned car, then a tent. I kept social climbing and just surfing and doing the things that teenagers did in those days, I guess. And I know there was a pivotal moment for you when you attended a lecture by Paul Bragg. And this was life-changing. So can you just tell our listeners how this happened? Well, I accumulated from the things I was consuming, uh, strychnine poisoning and cyanide poisoning. I almost died. I literally didn't think I was going to make it. In the process of recovering from that, I went to a health food store. In the health food store, there was a special flyer on the door as I was leaving saying, special guest speaker, Paul C. Bragg, Sunset Recreation Hall. And something intuitively said, I ought to go to that thing. And Paul Bragg was an amazing man, and he inspired millions of people around the world. I mean, even uh, Steve Jobs was impacted by him. Donald Trump was impacted by him. The list goes on of the people he's touched. And one night and one hour, this one man with his one message, I was absolutely inspired, and I thought maybe I could overcome my learning problems. I had never read a book from cover to cover up until that point. I had speech impediments, and I had... um, A desire to be intelligent, but I never thought I would be. And after that night, I thought maybe I could overcome this. And I decided that night that I really would like to learn how to read and someday be a teacher. That was November 18th, 1972. And I've been working on it ever since. So 45 plus years. Wow, that's a great story. Was there something specific he said at the time that inspired you or what really hit home? Well, a number of things. He said that uh, we have a body, we have a mind, and we have an inspiration and that our body must be guided by the mind, and our mind must be inspired to achieve greatness, and that we needed to fill our days with things that are meaningful and set goals for ourselves, our family, our community, our city, our state, our nation, our world, and beyond for 100 to 120 years. And if you don't have something to live for, you die. He said that, you know, deep inside you, there's a yearning to do something, you know, amazing with your life, and you got to give it permission to come out. He took us through this kind of guided imagery meditation experience 
in that experience, I saw myself standing out on a balcony in front of a million people speaking. I had no idea where that came from other than maybe some sort of dissociative identity disorder because I was learned disabled. And I've been using that as the vision that uh, has helped me go around the world. And I've been in about 140 countries and I've spoken to millions of people. So I think that had an impact on it, that vision that night. And it sounds like you really took that message from Paul Bragg to heart because what you teach people now is to determine people's highest value and doing things that are meaningful in their lives. So describe how you how you took this important message for yourself and now how you translate it to all these people that you get to speak to. Ever since that night, I just had a dream to overcome learning problems and learn and read and study and fill my mind with the greatest ideas I can and share them with as many people as I can. And I guess I've been a relentless man on a mission. And I do about a thousand interviews a year and I do about 300 to 400 speeches a year and I'm constantly writing every day. So I don't have anything else that I'd rather be doing. That's the most inspiring and most meaningful, most fulfilling thing that I get to do every day. So I just do it. When I first moved back from Hawaii, I had to fly to LA and I had to hitchhike back to Texas and I took a GED, high school equivalency test. And Paul Bragg gave me an affirmation that I'm a genius and I apply my wisdom. He said, to overcome your learning problems, say that every single day and never miss a day. He said, if you do that, sooner or later, the cells of your body will tingle it, so will the world. And I thought, okay. So I started saying that. I've never missed a day in 45 years. I said that, and somehow I guessed, and I passed (laughs) a high school equivalency test. And I all of a sudden, I had a high school degree, not because I went to school, but because I took that test. And my parents said, why don't you try a college one? See if you can pass that one, too a college entrance. And I went and took that. And somehow I guessed, I literally just guessed and put in dots and these little circular dots thing. And I passed. And then I failed my first actual test in school when I tried to go to school. And I almost gave up on the whole thing. But my mom said something to me that was absolutely massive. She said, son, whether you become a teacher, healer, and philosopher and travel the world like you dream, whether you go back to Hawaii and ride giant waves like you've done, or you return and panhandle as a bum on the street, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what you do. And when she said that, I don't know how to describe it. It was uh, my hand went into a fist. I looked up. I saw the vision of speaking in front of a million people. And I said to myself that I'm going to mass this thing called reading and teaching. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel whatever distance. I'm going to pay whatever price to give my service of love. There's a part of me that just says, no matter what anybody does, no one is going to get in the way with this thing. And I got and hugged my mom and I went in my room and I started memorizing a dictionary and learning how to speak and pronounce things. And my mom, tested me on 30 words a day until my vocabulary was strong enough where I could pass school. And I just went on and just excelled from there. And I just started reading 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day. And then I, at age 18, my first student appeared and then just kept growing and never stopped. That's so amazing. So let's talk about what you teach people. Let's talk about how you help people determine what their highest values are. Everybody lives by a set of priorities, a set of values. Whatever is highest on a person's value is what they're dedicated to, what they spontaneously love doing. If they set a goal that's congruent with that, they tend to achieve and they tend to have a greater expansion of possibilities for their life. And so if I ask people, what do they value? Many of them will inject the values of outer authorities and collective authorities instead of looking within and being true to themselves. And so what I do is I created a value determination series of questions to help narrow down what a person really values so they can set goals that get accomplished. And I ask people, how do you fill your space? Because things that are not important to you, you push away and things that you are very valuable to you keep near you. And how do you spend your time? You always find time for things that are really valuable to you and you run out of time for things that aren't. You know, what energizes you? Because you have more energy at the end of the day when you're doing something you love than if you're not. And what do you spend your money on? You find money for things that are valuable to you. Where are you most ordered? Where are you most disciplined? What do you think about, visualize, and affirm about how you want your life that shows evidence of coming true? What is it you are externally wanting to talk to people about most? What inspires you most? What are the most consistent goals that are coming true in your life? And what is it you love learning and reading about and studying about? And this gives you a good indication of what really your life is demonstrating as a value and to make sure you set goals that are matching that because otherwise you you'll end up self-defeating and and you're spontaneously disciplined on the things that are really valuable to you. So it's important to be congruent and integral with yourself. So most people are probably going through life likely living in disconnect with what their values are. You know, they're working a job or maybe they're not having the family that they want to have. They're not really getting true to themselves. So I'm guessing what you do, you really help people strip away the core and go back to the essence, which really is what life is all about, is doing the things that make us happy and doing the things that we love. 
if you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your life fills up with low priority distractions that don't. And if you don't pursue challenges that inspire you, you attract challenges that don't. So it's important to prioritize your life, to prioritize you know, what you read, prioritize what you do, prioritize who you are associating with, to take command. If, if you're not taking command from the inside, people take command from the outside. If you don't empower yourself from within, other people overpower you from without. And let's talk about how this comes into play within a relationship. So how understanding each other's highest values is important for a couple. Everybody wants to be loved and appreciated for who they are. And who they are revolves around their highest value. I've taken thousands and thousands of people through the value determination process. And I ask people, now that we've determined what's highest on your value, how many of you can see that your identity literally revolves around it and every hand goes up? And I explain to them that your ontology, your state of being is revolving around that one highest value. So a person in a relationship, they want to be loved for that. And so they want to be able to fulfill whatever is valuable to them. People think that somebody's committed to you. You know, they say, oh, you need to commit to me. But the real truth is people are committed to the fulfillment of what they value most. And if you don't assist them in fulfilling what they value, they withdraw from you. And they seek people that do help them fulfill what they value. It's wise to ask this question. First, determine the values by doing the value determination process between the two partners. And then ask how specifically is what your partner is dedicated to, their highest value, what's most inspiring and fulfilling to them, how is it helping you fulfill yours? And you need to answer that no less than 30 times, maybe up to even 80 times. Just keep linking and myelinating the brain to see that what they're dedicated to is serving you. So when you do that, you have the ability to articulate what's inspiring to you in terms of their values. And once you do that, two people start to not have to fix each other and project their values onto each other. But if you can't see what they're dedicated to as serving you, you'll tend to be self-righteous because you feel challenged. And then you'll tend to project your values onto them and expect them to live in your values, which is futile. But when you finally appreciate what they're doing, you start to respect them. And the dialogue that goes on instead of an alternating monologue, and you help build the relationship. So I've taken people that uh, I had them this weekend in, in the Breakthrough Experience program that I taught. I had a couple that were sitting there. They were just about to throw in the towel. And they said, this is our last effort. And I made them do the exercise for three hours. And it's a huge, huge difference. They both kept, how come somebody never taught this to us? I mean, it's like, this is like so simple. And they started to appreciate what each other's were doing instead of trying to change it. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Dr. D. Martini to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior. Not everybody wants to take their vitamins in a capsule form, and Sun Warrior has Vitamin Mineral Rush, which is a liquid form of minerals that you can take in any beverage. You can put it in your water, put it in your smoothie, and you're getting a wide range of B-complex vitamins, fulvic acid, and you just sip that back. It's going to give you a boost of energy, and it is really easy to absorb as well, which is a huge benefit. So get yourself some liquid Vitamin Mineral Rush and add that to your cart for your next order. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off all Sun Warrior purchases. To take advantage, it's super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. For listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and take advantage of this incredible deal right now. And now a shout out to other show sponsor, Thrive Market. And if you're in the USA and you haven't put together your order yet, today is your day. Start loading up your cart and you can definitely start loading it up with Simple Meals products. Jesse and I have been loving these products. I have made everything from the pizza dough to the flatbread to the cookies. They are all delicious and they are all grain-free, gluten-free, mostly vegan. Some of them you have to add eggs into. They are a wonderful thing to have on hand if you just want to put together a quick meal, sweet or savory. So get yourself some Simple Meals products and Thrive Market has so many more products as well that are both gluten-free, vegan, paleo, anything your heart desires. And all the products at Thrive Market are 20 to 50% off of regular retail value. In addition, you're getting 25% off your order as a listener of our show plus a 30-day free trial plus free shipping. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. This deal is incredible. We love Thrive Market. Go and shop right now. And now back to our chat with Dr. D. Martini. Martini. 
Earlier, you touched on high priority actions versus low priority distractions. So first of all, how do we determine which is which? And then what do we do with whatever falls under each of these categories? I was speaking in Dallas, Texas at the Anatole to Mary Kay's group. We had 4,500 women there. And afterwards, I had a chat with Mary Kay Ash. And I asked her, you know, what advice can you give young aspiring speaker traveling the world? And she said, uh, every day, write down the seven highest priority action steps you can do that day that can help you fulfill your dreams. And so I got some index cards out and I wrote those down every day. And I did that for a couple of years and had nearly a thousand of them accumulated. And then I went through there and I looked at what was the priorities of the priorities of the priorities of all those days. I took the first card and I wrote down what was on it. I tossed it, took the second card, wrote down what was on it. And anything that was duplicated, I put a slash slash. And I just kept going through it to see what was the highest priorities of the highest priorities over time. And for me, it ended up being research, write, travel, teach. So I realized that, okay, these are the highest priority actions that keep showing up to be the most productive things I can do. And then what I did is I made a commitment to delegate everything else off my plate and give all lower priority things to other people and give them a chance to do what they love so I can go do what I love. And then I made a list one day after reading Alec McKenzie's book, The Time Trap. I made a list of everything that I did in a day. And right next to it, I wrote down how much does it produce per hour as far as productivity and service. And then I write down how much meaning does it provide me on a one to 10 scale? How much would it cost to have somebody do this if I delegated it? And how much time is spent on it? And by going through that, sorting through that, I was able to prioritize what was really most important to least important. And it just happened to match perfectly what I found with Larry Kay. It was identical. And so I realized that my job is those four things and my job is to delegate everything else away. So today, I don't do anything else. I haven't driven in 27 and a half years. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I don't do domestic things. I don't do administrative things. I only research, write, travel, teach, and everything else is off my plate. So I can be the greatest at what I do and not be bogged down by things that I'm uninspired by and then trapped and distracted and micromanaging. And it's so important to really, truly be honest about what's important to you and let go of the rest. So when we find out what these high priority actions are for us, Does it make sense to form like a daily to-do list and then break that down into smaller tasks you want to do each and every day? Or how do we go from there? If you go through a daily checklist, I'm I'm all for that. These are things that you've proven that help you in your life. I have a, a checklist myself. But when you narrow it down to the basic essence, you don't need a big, long checklist. You've narrowed it down to the highest priority things. As Gary Keller says in his book, The One Thing, you want to get down to the one thing that you do greatest and quit doing low priority stuff. I learned that if I go and do what I do best, which is a way of serving people productively, that's why you need to know what it produces per hour. I am making plenty of income to pay for people to do everything else. I don't do anything except what I do best. I don't have this massive checklist that I need to do, but it's just things to absolutely do what I know is inspiring to me. In my case, teaching is the highest. So teaching is a live presentation like I do tonight to hundreds of people. I'm doing webinars today and I'm doing podcast, I'm doing TV, and I'm doing radio, and I'm doing interviews for media, I'm doing uh, articles, and I I do consulting. And then in between my teaching, I'm writing. I'm researching books, and I'm writing, and I'm online, and I'm researching and writing. So there's not a big checklist. Well, that's what I want to get into next, actually. So once you have it broken down into these bigger categories, how do you decide what to say yes and what to say no to? And how important is it for us to get good at saying no to different things? Well, if you can't say no to things that are low priority, you'll never get to say yes to things that are. So your job is to say thank you, but no thank you. That's not priority. Now, today, I've even delegated that out. I have all my priorities laid out. I hand over to one individual worldwide who has a governance over my itinerary, and she gives me an updated itinerary daily. We know that teaching comes in number one, research is in there, and I have somebody that I delegate that to. And as interviews come in around the world, I have it all go filter through and she prioritizes it and then sends it to me the day before so I know what my itinerary is. So I don't even have to do that. I already know what it is. I've delegated that responsibility out so I don't have to sit there and do administrative work of any form. When you make a list of what you do and how much is it produced per hour per day, I found out a long time ago when I was in practice years ago, I found out that me sitting there even with the clients was less productive than me going out and speaking and inspiring people to become clients. And I found that one produced way more. So why would I do something that's less productive unless I want to devalue myself? So I just let go of anything that was devaluing me. Because anytime you do low priority things, you devalue yourself. Anytime you do high priority things that are most productive, that serve most people, you value yourself. So it was pretty straightforward on which is which. 
And when you, you know, when you fill your day with very high priority things and you have a full agenda, it's easy to say no when you got a full day. So question for you. So you're functioning at a high level right now, you know, traveling across the world, you've got a big team. What about people in their everyday life? How can they take on things like outsourcing or delegating, whether it's running a household or in a small business or just practicing that art, which can be a very difficult art, I know for myself and even as our business is growing, now we're starting to need to delegate more and more. And it takes time to take that on. So I just want you to maybe inspire people who maybe need to look at how they can start to maximize their life at where they're at right now. Well, the exercise I just gave you where you write down everything that you do and how much it produces per hour, whether you're at home as a mother or whether you're at work, this exercise works. I mean, I've used it on both cases many, many thousands of times. And many times housewives that are sitting there, they realize they're doing maid service. And this may be confronted what I'm about to say, but anytime a woman is capable or a man is capable of earning and producing and serving people at a higher level, and they're going in there at home, they're sitting there doing mediocre jobs that are $10, $20 an hour jobs, they're devaluing themselves. They'd be wiser to go out and do a little bit of work, even if it's part-time, and pay for some specialist to come in and do that and then have higher quality time with the kids. But if you're sitting there trapped because of some idealism, because somebody who wrote a book who has no potential for greater income is telling you that this is how you live your life and trying to be a super mom and scattering yourself and disempowering yourself, well, that's foolish. I've had thousands of women over the years get out of their trap just by doing that exercise, prioritizing it and working their way up and gaining specialized knowledge and starting a career path that allows them to do the things they love or their husband doing the same thing. So he's able to produce more. So they have more income to hire specialists. I tell husbands, I said, do you want to be married to a maid? And they said, no. I said, why are you doing it? (laughs) I said, why don't you go and work and prioritize, make more income, pay for the thing, let your wife uh, do the things that are inspiring, maybe do philanthropic work or something and get on with their life. Otherwise, they're going to be trapped doing something that they're not inspired by. And then they're going to be blaming the husband and say, well, you should be doing this with me because I don't want to have to do it. And this is not how you live an inspired life. So you have to prioritize. Now, if you love cooking, then fantastic, do it. But if you don't, then be honest with yourself and, and see if you have some skills that can be developed that can serve people and give your own identity. You could otherwise resent your own children over time for trapping you. So, Dr. Martini, a lot of what we're talking about to this point has to do with focus. And with what's going on here in the 21st century, things like email, social media, there's so many different things that are fighting for our attention, distracting us. How do you go about eliminating these or minimizing these and keeping focus throughout the day? Well, I don't have a cell phone for one. (laughs) That's not my highest priority thing is to sit and do social media every day. I delegate most of that out. I write quietly in my time, write things for the media for post. I then send it off to a person that's responsible for that piece. If they have any special questions to me, I will then write. But I don't sit there and do, I don't know, diatribe or whatever with people all day long about gossip and stuff on social media. I think that's absolutely ridiculous to spend time on that. I think social media is a very powerful tool. So I use it in a way where it's not distracting me, but I use it to serve people with it. I have no problem serving people with an inspiring message on Facebook and these things and trying to answer questions to people's needs. But I'm not interested in hearing about gossip or things like that, so I don't engage in any of that stuff. So earlier when we were talking about finding out our highest values, we touched on goals and how they should be related. How do you yourself go about goal setting? How often are you doing it? What do you do to get in there and figure out what you're going to attack next? Just explain to us what this looks like. Most people set up fantasies, and then they end up having anxiety and fears and hesitations And they don't know why, but their unconscious is trying to whisper to them saying that the goal they're setting is not balanced and they haven't used their executive center to mitigate the risks and strategize the pathway through the real challenges it's faced is to accomplish a great goal. I always say, start with what you know and let what you know grow. Don't waste your time on a goal that you're questioning, only something you're certain that your life demonstrates you're committed to. If you don't see any actions towards a goal in a short period of time from setting it, it's obviously not important to you. You'd be doing it. And to make sure you chunk it down into small bites and do little action steps every day. If you take a little action step every day towards a big goal, you get it. I always say piggy banks become biggie banks and little actions make big dreams. See, when you live incongruently with your highest values, the blood glucose and oxygen goes up in the executive center of the brain and awakens the area of the brain that sees a vision that strategically plans, executes it, and governs the emotional behavior. And so if you're setting a goal, and if it's really truly congruent and important to you, You'll set a strategy on mitigating any possible obstacles. 
you'll see them on the way, not in the way, and you'll pursue it. You won't give up on it. But many people set up fantasies like a New Year's resolution, something, a temporary fantasy. And then the second it gets challenging, they give up on it. That's not really a goal. That's a temporary fantasy with hesitation and anxiety surfacing to try to bring them back into the center. I've started writing goals out and I've got a 4,000 page document that I call the state of the mission address with all my goals in it and all the metrics in it. If you're not really metricing it and making sure that you're achieving it and measuring it on a frequent basis, you're not really serious about the goal. And so I metric it. I keep records of that and I keep a gratitude list and I have a post humus biography in this manual. I have all of my goals in there, and I update them as I read through it. It's the most active book of my life. You touched on gratitude there, and you've talked about how when you're almost four years old, your mother told you to count your blessings, and this had a big impact on you. So can you talk about what happened there and how important gratitude is to your well-being? Well, I was born on Thanksgiving Day, so I think that had something to do with it. My mom was putting me to bed when I was four, and she said, make sure when you go to bed before you go into the dream to count your blessings, to think about what you're grateful for, because those that are grateful for what they have, they get more to be grateful for. And I found that to be quite true. So I have the largest list of gratitudes of any human being I've met on earth. It's 10.1 inch margins, and it's just thousands and thousands of pages of gratitudes. I do it every single day. In fact, I've already typed in this interview as a gratitude in that book already. That's already been done today. (laughs) Right on. So how important is this, though, for your well-being? And how do you go about Like, do you revisit these? How do you keep track? Just expand on that a little bit. I love reading all the things that I had the opportunity to do that I'm grateful for. And this is even challenges. I had a challenging client in the seminar this weekend, and I was grateful for what I learned from that. So it doesn't necessarily always support things. It's supportive or challenging things you can be grateful for. And it's what you learn from it and what you had the opportunity and experience of and the people you meet. I mean, tonight I'm meeting one of the greatest quantum computer experts, and we're having a meeting tonight on quantum theory. And I get to speak to hundreds of people tonight, and that's in the gratitude book. And I have a meeting with somebody who's a, on his way into being a billionaire at lunch, and that's a gratitude book. I have a lot to be grateful for, and when I focus on that, I get more to be grateful for. Well, I think that's really inspiring, and I think a lot of people, when it comes to gratitude, think that they need to come up with these big things that happen every day. And I think the more the merrier. Like, think of everything that's going on in your day and just find those little things that you might have overlooked or might not have paid attention to. And to write it down, I think that is key too, to make sure it's written down somewhere so you can reflect back on it or to get those words on paper. So thanks for sharing your practice. I was told by an Indian guy that was a mentor of mine when I was 23, he said, do not go to bed until you can rehearse the entire day and see every one of it in a way that it's on the way, not in the way. If there's anything in the day that you can't say thank you for, you're ending the day with an incomplete. And I've made that a ritual and that way I document it on paper. I've been doing it for all these years and it's a very rewarding and fulfilling, energizing experience. For many years, I wrote down what are the highest priorities for the day, but after a while, you just know what they are, and you just get on with them, and you delegate things and structure things so you can fulfill your life. It's your life. Nobody's going to get up in the morning and dedicate their life to you. There's no genie out there that's going to do it. You're it. So if you're not taking command and and structuring it, not being the architect and captain of your ship, you know everybody else is going to join in and do it. Well, speaking to you, it's obvious you're doing what you love day in, day out. I'm just curious, though, how important would you say this is to achieving the level of success that you have? Well, I I don't think I would do it if it uh, didn't pay off. So I don't have an alternative life. That's the life I've lived. So I don't know where my life would be. I can only guess because I really believe that that's a rewarding pathway and a focus. And it's a metric and it gives feedback. It makes you accountable and it makes you ask quality questions. And the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions you're asking. It makes you look at your life and ask quality questions. So I think it's just a ritual that's a smart ritual to do, but not everybody does it. There's great people that do amazing success that don't do it. So I can't say that that's the only way, but I certainly can say it's been helpful for me. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Dr. Martini to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Four Sigmatic. I hope at this point you guys have stocked up on chaga, reishi, cordyceps, and now you need to get your hands on lion's mane. And the benefit of lion's mane is that it's really good for concentration, focus, and memory. And Jesse and I love to open up a sachet of this, just mix it into our morning elixir. And again, you can also just have it plain as is. That is the beauty and the ease of Four Sigmatic products is that you can just open them up and they're ready to go. As a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Four Sigmatic purchases. To take advantage, super easy to do. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash foursigmatic. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash foursigmatic. 
Listeners in the U.S. and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. These products are amazing. Marnie and I use them on a regular basis and love them. Go and get yours today. And now a shout out to other show sponsor, Raw Elements. And a product that you guys have to get your hands on is Lakanto. And this is a natural sweetener coming from monk fruit. It's a granulated sugar-like substance that has no calories and you can add it into your baked goods, your elixirs, your pancake batters, and you can get it as a full bag or you can get it in small sachets that you can just rip open on the go and put it into your tea or any other beverage that you want. It's something that's easy to consume and something you can take with you anywhere you go or use it at home. Try Lakanto today. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Raw Elements purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. Listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and get yourself some Lakanto sweetener right now. And now back to our chat with Dr. D. Martini. And it sounds like you've had some mentors along the way, people like Paul Bragg, your mom, I'm sure there's been many more. So can you speak to this, how important mentors or coaches or other inspiring people have been in your journey and how important it is for maybe people to seek out someone like this? Without a doubt. I mean, when I look back, I was born with my hand and foot turned in. I had a deformity of my arm and leg and I had to have a therapist or physical therapist or occupational therapist or who knows what they called them in those days to help me, you know, walk straight, and I had a speech pathologist as a little child. Well, all this was up till age four. So those are mentors that helped me in my life. At 14, I hitchhiked to California, and I met Howard Hughes, believe it or not. And um, that was an amazing thing, because he took me into a library when I was in El Paso, Texas. And he said, now, young man, you got to learn how to read, because they can take away your loved ones, they can take away your possessions, but they can never take away your love and wisdom. So man, you need to learn how to read and gain the wisdom of love and the love of wisdom. And he said, those are the two things you never want to forget because that can never be taken away from you. So that was Howard Hughes. And I met Timothy Leary also when I was 14. He was an interesting thing. He said, look, the universe is your home. (laughs) He was out there. He was cosmic. And that left uh, an imprint on me because today I always say that the universe is my playground. The world is my home, which literally is because I live on a ship called the world. And um, every country is a room in the house and every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. So I believe that each of these people had little impacts. I have cufflinks now that say love and wisdom on them, and I have a cosmic kind of existence. So everybody had an impact on me. Then I met Paul Bragg, and that definitely had an impact on me. Then I met uh, Lakish Waran, this Indian guy at six PhDs at 23. He had a major impact on me. Then Jim Parker had an impact on me in the speaking industry. Mary Kay had an impact on me. And thousands and thousands of books. I mean, I've read over 30,000 books. And then... uh, Religious leaders that I've met, I've met the Bampa Lama and the Dalai Lama and the Pope and these people. So they all had influence. And now today I have specialists in different fields. They send me literature and updated research that's inspiring to them on a regular basis. So it helps my research. So I've even delegated my research so I can read the highest priority material from the greatest minds in the greatest fields. So I'm constantly getting mentors in that way. There's hundreds of mentors along the way, but I can't say there's just one, but been many. Do you think you just got lucky by being introduced or stumbling upon some of these people all along your life? You know, the the old saying that preparation increases luck, preparation meaning opportunity. I set out when I was 20, I wrote down 50 people that I wanted to meet in the world. And literally by the time I was 35, maybe 36, I met all 50 of those. That's amazing. Right now, that list, I keep a list of all the people that have, anybody that does global things, it's known around the world that does global things, whether it's in media or what's in politics or in religion or it's in business leadership or whatever, I keep a list of them and it's now going close to the 2000 mark. So I keep an inventory. I'm a very much a metric person. I figured if I associate with people that have global effect, I have a higher probability of creating a global effect. That's a great way to look at it. And what do you recommend to someone who's maybe looking to be inspired by somebody or hasn't had that opportunity to, you know, meet that special someone or, you know, whether it's coincidence or by, you know, by purpose? So finding a mentor for people, like how can we get people inspired to do that? Well, the first thing to do is have a vision. If your vision isn't big, you're not going to do big things. When I was 23, 24, I was in school. I made a list of all the Nobel Prize winners. I wanted to read every single thing that they had ever written, all their Nobel Prize winning speeches. I wanted to find out what was the common denominator and characters of each of those people. I wanted to then discover where those traits were in me so I didn't think I was missing anything. 
In those days, there was no internet, no emails, no faxes. There was nothing. You just made a telephone call and you could get access with a operator to anybody. <laughs> there was no people shut out from telephone like they are today. So I started calling Nobel Prize winners. I got Linus Pauling on the line. I said, yeah, this is John Martini." And he says, yes. And uh, How can I help you? And I said, you're a hero of mine. You got two Nobel Prizes and chemistry and uh, peace. And I said, I'd like to just ask you some questions. He said, all right. And, and he told me something that that one conversation had been with me ever since. Never forgot it. And it's 40 years later. He says, you know, I can't wait to get up in the morning and go into my lab and see if I can make one more great discovery that can change humanity. That one thing inspired me, that just that one statement made a difference. I was with Paul Nernst in Austria at uh, Milk Abbey speaking, another Nobel Prize winner in biology. We're chatting, and he told me a story that was inspiring that I, you don't forget. He said when he was born, he was raised, he assumed the mother that he was raised by was his mother, but it turned out to be his grandmother. And he found out that he had an older sister that was 12 years old that got pregnant. And the parents didn't want anybody to know about it. The parents took the girl and put her in another country and disowned her and took the child and raised him. But he innately, in a void inside his life, always wanted to know the origin of life and the real genetics. So when he was getting the Nobel Prize, they asked him to put together a full biography of his life for the Nobel Prize. And that's when he discovered that his real mother was his sister. And so he insisted that that sister be at the Nobel Prize speech. And the parents that were humiliated by the child, turned out to be most honored by the various child that they rejected. And it was a touching story. And it was, it was amazing. And it showed how important your voids in life can become your values. And the challenges can become the great opportunities. I made a list one time. I had a kid that came into my seminar one time. And he said, I have no mom and dad. I'm an orphan. I said, OK, great. He goes, what do you mean great? He said, I didn't have parents. And I said, great. And I said, come with me. Let's go online. And I pulled out 700 of the most powerful people in living in history, from Sir Isaac Newton to Tycho Brahe to Steve Jobs and everybody else, who are orphans. These are the most powerful people on the planet. They started up just like you. You must have a big destiny. His life changed that day. His commitment to doing something amazing came out. And instead of using his so-called orphan story as an obstacle, he turned it into a, a motivating factor in his life. So I think it's inspiring to interact and read and interact with people that do extraordinary things. I have a friend Pat Falvey in Ireland, who has climbed Mount Everest four times to the peak, he's walked to the North and South Pole, and he swam the Amazon River. So that's a rare bird. And his mission every day, he says, what is my greatest fear today and how do I conquer it? That's his, his affirmation every day. Let's talk about fear for a bit. How does this fit into the whole equation? When we have fear, all of us being human, we face fears on a daily, regular basis. But what do we do when we come across them? And what does your approach look like? Well, fear is a feedback system. People don't think that's bad. Fear is a gift. Fear is letting you know a number of things. One, you're having an assumption that there's about to be more negatives and positives in your perceptions or reality in the future. And two, usually that's because of the fear of loss of some fantasy you're building or the fear of gain of an unmitigated risk. And so that means it's trying to get you back to your objective center to set real goals that are balanced and have all the strategies to mitigate the risks. It's a friend. It's not an enemy. Most people say, oh, I want to cancel my fear and get rid of my fear. I'm grateful for my fears. They let me know I have unclear goals that are not quite centered, that are not congruent, that need more attention. And the second I get the goal complete, guess what happens? There's no fear. I have an action step. I know what it does, and I don't focus on the problem. I focus on the solution. So fear is your friend. It's not your enemy. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of refinement needed. That's all. It's trying to make sure you set real goals in real time. So, Dr. Demartini, you come across as somebody who's on point. You come across very happy, content with the way things are going with your life. But if you had to sum it down, what would you say has been really key to getting to that point of happiness? Well, I don't pursue happiness. So I don't mean to be you know, disrespectful to you there. I'm more into fulfillment than happiness. Aristotle talked about hedonistic happiness versus eudaimonic happiness, well-being and fulfillment. I'm not interested in a one-sided world where I'm looking for happy and avoiding sad or pleasure without pain or joy without sorrow. Or I don't have this fantasy of a one-sided world. The Buddha says the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is the source of people's suffering. And the animal passion to try to find a one-sided outcome with a desire from dopamine fix can blind people into infatuations with not goals, but fantasies. I'm a firm believer in having a balance in life. I see that any of my emotions are feedback systems. In fact, if I'm happy, I'm usually blind to the downside to things. It's time for me to go back and look at my goal more closely. If I'm sad, it's time to do and look at the upsides. 
But when I'm actually seeing both sides, I feel centered and poised and I feel inspired. And that's different. An inspired eudaimonic state with well-being and fulfillment is way greater than a transient fleeting moment of happiness. Now, some people use that happiness a different way. And so they may use it the way I'm talking about, but I'm not really in pursuit of happiness. In fact, I wrote a book. I gave up happiness that made me too sad. The joy of depression as a fun spoof one time. So I guess what you're saying is you want to embrace the full spectrum, the happy, the sad moments, the whole picture. I say that as long as you're addicted to happiness, you're going to have a sad life because you're trying to get a one-sided outcome. You know, if I came up to you and I said to you, you're always nice, you're never mean, you're always kind, you're never cruel, you're always positive, you're never negative, you're always pleased, you're never displeased, you're always peaceful, you're never warful, you're always generous, you're never stingy. And I said that, isn't that true? And you'd go, uh, your bullshit meter would go off. And it would say, well, I can't say always. And then if I said to you, you're always mean, you're never nice, you're always cruel, you're never kind, you're always negative, you're never positive, you're always wrathful, you're never peaceful, you're always taking, you're never giving, your bullshit meter would go off and say, no, that's not me either. But if I said to you, sometimes you're kind, sometimes you're cruel, sometimes you're positive, sometimes you're negative, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, sometimes you're peaceful, sometimes you're wrathful, sometimes you're generous, sometimes you're stingy, your bullshit meter, your intuitive bullshit meter would immediately calm down and you immediately go, yep, that's true. So I don't have the fantasy of only one side. I have the realization that I am both sided and I need both sides and I don't need to get rid of half of myself in order to love myself. So I want to switch gears and talk about relationships. I want to get into what are some of the factors that make for a healthy romantic relationship? Again, when people, they're committed to the fulfillment of their own values. And whenever they feel that you're helping them fulfill their values, they open up and they feel appreciated and they're more likely to be more intimate. I think that every three months, it's wise to do a value link between you and your spouse. And I think also every three months, it's wise to do what I call the Demartini method. And that was you make a list of everything that you think they've done that's challenged you and define it. I ask the question, what specific trait, action, inaction have they displayed or demonstrated specifically that they've done that you feel most resentful to or upset about? And then ask yourself, where and when are you displaying or demonstrating this specific trait, action, inaction to somebody? And who are you displaying it to and who sees you do it? And then go in there and keep looking and keep looking and own it. Because if you think that they're doing something and you're denying where you're doing it, you're going to start to think self-righteously that they need to change. And then you're undermining the relationship because you start projecting onto them. But if you can see where you do it, it softens the judgment. And then if you can ask whatever they've done, go to the moment when and where they displayed it and ask how specifically has it served you? How's it helping you? How's it helping fulfill your highest values? It's not what they do. It's how you perceive it. And if you perceive it in a way that it's on the way, not in the way, you appreciate the person. Quality questions can neutralize accumulation of emotional charges from misinterpretations and projections of your values onto them or interpretations that they're supposed to be one-sided. These things undermine relationships. So knowing and having the tools of the Demartini method and also the value linking just to help people in their relationship. And if they do it every quarter before it accumulates where it's so overwhelming that they feel burned out by the relationship, they'll keep it fresh. Every weekend, the Breakthrough Experience program that I do 43 times a year, people are basically saying after they've done the exercise, you know, they went home and made love and they hadn't been making love and they're back to having intimacy again because they feel appreciation for each other. Well, that's a great place to wrap up. And, you know, we've given so much great information over the course of this interview. But what I would love for you to do is if there's one thing that you can leave our listeners with, one thing that they can take action on today, what would it be? Have them go on the drdmartini.com, go on the website and actually fill out the value determination process and start getting clear about what's really important to them. Ask themselves a simple question. What is the highest priority actions I can do today? What is the most productive things I can do? And start sticking to the priorities. Start documenting what they're accomplishing. And then practice delegating. Find a way of delegating. Surround yourself with people who are experts in what you need to delegate. Delegate it. And then say a little affirmation every day. I now give myself permission to do something extraordinary on planet Earth. And know that no matter what you've done or not done, you're worthy of love. And it's all feedback. It's all on the way. And it's all helping you become magnificent. All right. Well, Dr. Demartini, how else can the listeners go and connect with you after the show? Well, the easiest way is just, I just gave out the website, drdemartini.com. Find out where I am around the world. And there's thousands of interviews and all kinds of products and educational information for people. They can go on there and probably spend the rest of their life and just keep learning on there. And they can find out where I'm at and where the webinars and things that I do. So that's the best place, drdmartini.com or maybe my Facebook. All right. We're going to link both those up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. 
And Dr. Demartini, just want to thank you for coming on the show. This has been fun and wishing you all the best. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity and congratulations on all the people you make a difference in and the dedication you have to your mission. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Take care. Thank you. We hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Demartini. So much great information that you can start applying into your lives today. And the best thing you can do for us is share our show. You guys did such a good job last week sharing stories on Instagram. So make sure you take a picture and follow us at Ultimate Health Podcast and tag us as well and show us where you are listening to our show. We would love to see it. Thank you guys so much for helping share the show. We really appreciate it. And you guys rock for helping us continue to grow. Before we let you go, I want to give a shout out to our engineer and editor, Jason Sanderson at podcasttech.com. Jace, thanks for doing such a great job with the show. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he likes making his own studio equipment and he's just about to order some new parts to start building. That is awesome. You guys have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.